Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hey, today is May 14th, 2018, and you're listening to our Human Factors Cast User Experience Professionals Association 2018, or UXPA, for all you layman's folks. Bonus episode, I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by my good friend and yours, Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. Man, Nick, you killed it saying UXPA. I can't believe you even didn't mess it up, because I totally would. Nailed it. And live from Boston, we got Brian McDonald on the line. Hey, everyone. Hey, there he is. So, Brian, you're actually one of our listeners, one of our Patreon uh, supporters, and uh, frequent Slack contributor, um, and you had the opportunity to go to UXPA Boston, and so we're going to kind of pick your brain about what you saw there. Um, But before we do that, I just want to welcome some of our brand new listeners. We tend to pick up a lot of new listeners on these bonus episodes. So if you're just joining us, welcome to the show. Uh, Like I said, we do have a Slack. You can go hang out with us in there and and get more detail. Uh, Brian's got some interesting, uh, fun documents from UXPA. So go and check those out. But Brian, I'm curious, what was UXPA like? Um, It was super awesome. One thing that really jumped out at me was because uh, I have a design background, and a lot of other people there had a very psych-heavy background. And everyone who wasn't a designer was kind of flabbergasted that everyone at UXPA was like just so nice. Because <laughs> the Boston design community, everyone's just super nice, and everyone knows everyone. Everyone's like two steps away. <laughs> so, so there was a lot of camaraderie there amongst all the... So, so you you said it was more uh, psych based people, or was it more design based? Pe- I'm I'm a little so well, was was there a nice healthy mix? Yeah, so there was a really good healthy mix of psych people, design people, and even like business manager people. But all the like Boston design people kind of know the Boston design community, and everyone's just assuming that everyone else is going to be helpful and friendly. But. Uh, like without fail, every single person I talked to that like had a psych heavy background was like, everyone's so nice. It's it's so weird. There's no like posturing. <laughs> that's awesome, man. I'm glad that that is the case. I mean, that's kind of how it should be, even if it's like not even, especially when it's a multidisciplinary thing, right? Because when you talk about UX, you get that mix of just of designers, like you said, product managers, but also people with psych heavy backgrounds so i'm glad it was a good experience yeah and and what i find sometimes is that you know even though there are those with the psych heavy background the, the people who have more education tend to um how do i how do i say this diplomatically they tend to sort of discount some of the things that or or discredit some of the things that folks without that same education has but really this is talking to people in the field who are sort of getting hands-on experience and providing new, interesting, different, exciting ways uh, for how to do user experience. So I'm curious, Brian, if you want to just talk us through kind of your experience, like from a chronological order, uh, what kind of going to UXPA was like. Yeah, so um, I guess in the morning they had a cool kickoff that just kind of talked about what their whole thing was about and how i think they're like 20 years old now oh wow so, yeah USP boston's one of the biggest groups too across yeah, the country it's actually the oldest uxpa chapter so like the conference had a thousand people and actually had to turn some people away wow wow i didn't even know they they were having to turn people away that's that's crazy so they did this sort of uh introductory Hey, how you doing? This is what our mission is. Uh, do they have any sort of plenary speaker or um, keynote speaker there? Um, they had a keynote speaker, but it was really just an introduction to the UXPA and what to expect through the day. And then individual tracks broke out. There were like four different tracks. And what? So did you per- go ahead, Blake? Did you prescribe to like a specific track? Like where did where did you go from there? So I jumped around um, because they had different tracks that were, uh, what were they? It was like design, business, research, and something else that I'm missing. 
Cool. So that, but, that sounds like a healthy mix of what would be in the user experience field as a whole. So where did where'd you start? Yeah, so I started with uh, interactive journey maps. So um, a design firm that's centered in Boston did this whole talk on interactive journey maps and how it can make uh, their design a lot more scalable because they started by making the typical journey map for a product. And then when they finished, they had 40 feet of paper. Of course, as is typical of a journey map, right? They're just like yeah. as big as you can make them. Yeah, and it was like 40 feet of three foot wide paper. They just printed it out and they were like, yeah, we did a really good job. We captured everything. No one can use this. <laughs> Right. So yeah. So when you say like no one can use it just for anybody at home, like Nick, this is analogous, I guess, to like doing a workflow too. Oh yeah. I think journey mapping is much bigger in the user experience kind of sector of things. But imagine like a I don't know, almost an entire wall that's forty feet long of just stuff that's showing you what a user is doing through like each step of the workflow. And so you're saying that they came up with kind of a process or a way to get around that or to make it more useful. Yeah, so after they realized that this deliverable will just sit in a filing cabinet and never be used, they kind of took it back to square one and figured out how can we make this so people can actually use it. So they made a digital version of this. Awesome. So what did the digital version look like? Is it is it because I mean, you're you're presumably operating off of something like this in a web interface um especially if you're making it available to other people is it just a horizontally scrolling web page or do they did they like transpose it and make it vertical what does this look like and what kind of interactive elements are there in the digital version so it kind of started by mimicking the uh physical version in that it's a horizontal scroll that has everything roughly linearly but you could also embed certain elements and you could hide and expand certain elements. So if, say, you were just the uh, front-end developer, you might not care about certain step-throughs, so you could hide those. And then you could actually embed some of the research itself, so like a recording of an interview with someone. So you could have something like, oh, note on uh, most people don't like this button. And then you have people describing exactly their feelings about it. Oh, that's kind of cool. So you, you also embed the user feedback directly into the thing. So that way anyone who's looking at this interactive uh, journey map, they can see directly from the user's mouth almost, right, uh, what kind of the feedback around that thing was. Yes, that sounds and, like a really powerful tool, too. Yeah, especially because, I mean, getting buy-in without people actually being there is always super hard. So being able to show people, not just tell them and, yeah, believe me. Exactly. And, and this would be even better, like, uh, let's say you design a product and you, you launch it. I mean, even after the fact, if you've gone through iterations, you've talked to people and this kind of stands as that living, almost like a living document that you can always refer to. If you start like seeing problems or hearing from other people, like, why did you do it this way? Well, like, here's X, Y and Z. What we found like pre-launch and maybe it's time to like do a recursive loop and go back. But that that sounds like an awesome product compare, especially when you're comparing it to these really, really massive journeys journey maps you typically see um and I, I really like the idea of you being able to you know from different parties perspectives whether it's a stakeholder designer or like a front-end developer like you mentioned being able to hop in there and kind of find the information they need and only kind of like pay attention to that so that's an awesome design choice yeah for sure so okay so that was the first one were there any other sort of nuggets from that one that we can kind of pull out uh from so so the horizontal's scroll and and then the interactive elements of uh kind of tailoring to whoever's looking at it right you mentioned the developers being able to collapse certain sections um and being able to interact and see specific user feedback were there any other interactive elements within that that you can remember uh that was the main one they just had like the columns of experience steps digital front of house elements 
and then the people based elements and then all the backstage tech and algorithms okay Don't okay go. so so we started with the interactive journey maps and then where did you go to next Uh, from there, I went to Hope is Not a Method. Ooh, so That sounds yeah. interesting. That's a drawing <laughs> title for sure. Yeah, it was about how to improve diversity in your design team, make better products. And uh, it started with a great story about the title. Um, so the title came from her pastor. And her pastor would always tell teens who are coming of age that hope is not a method and if you're just hoping that's not a good plan to uh prevent things from occurring that's very i mean that's true in all sorts of walks of life right like you have to be proactive about the things that you do hoping is not really enough <laughs> yeah oh i mean i don't so, know I, my philosophy has always been uh hope for the best but expect the worst so <laughs> Yeah, I think it's uh, expecting the worst that's always uh, key there. Right, yeah. <laughs> okay, so so they go through the story, um, hope's not a good plan to prevent things from occurring. Um, and then, so, so what did they offer as an alternative to hope? Um, really just intentionality of it and making sure you uh, realize everything that, all those subtle effects. So they started with, this really cool design for a red dot design award winner for a pregnancy test. So it won awards for good design, but it forgot how a woman pees. Oh my goodness. Oh boy. All right. <laughs> Three like dudes talking about how women testing, pee. Apparently. Yeah. <laughs> zero user testing designed by a whole bunch of dudes. And it's a pregnancy test. So, and hang on, really a quick, great, uh, gif of a fireman trying to catch a rogue fire hose. <laughs> that's a that's a great image. So wait, I I have a question. This thing won yeah. a design award for this thing, yep. but it's completely unusable by women. Is that what I'm understanding here? That is a hundred percent correct. It had a very ergonomic handle and a very small point for actually catching P. Jeez. So wow. that that's I mean a, a perfect example though of what they're trying to talk about of just having diversity in teams. But that's that's even a little more beyond just diversity. That's like having an actual potential user or somebody who may may have to, you know, have this product one day be a part of the team to help you build it i mean having a, a room full of dudes build something that they would never ever use that's target for a specific population that just seems wrong in general but did they have any kind of like tips or ways of going about trying to really make sure that when you're building design teams or building products that you're making sure to get that diversity in your teams or at least diverse lines of thought yeah uh one thing they talked about a lot was how language matters um, because a lot of people will look at job descriptions and then self-select. So not everyone wants to be in a super competitive environment. You probably don't want to have want to see work hard, play hard if you have a kid. So um, they had a slide from text. Ito, Textio, Textio, um, yeah, and they helped uh, show how different languages can be either more appealing to men or more appealing to women. Is this like uh, mm -hmm. the font itself, or like all attributes of text? So, uh, font, color, um, only size. words. Only okay, only only the words. So it's yeah. like semantics meaning okay. different things or being interpreted differently from other people? Yeah, so like um, Amazon, wickedly fast-paced environment, manacle, that all was very male-heavy. And then Apple's comfortably empathetic was more female-heavy. 
So that's interesting. That's kind of taking the the route of, you know, for intake, for getting the kind of people we want to apply to the jobs, just changing the wording in general of how we put those or how you're putting those exact, you know, job descriptions out there. But I, I, f- I feel like I don't know how effective that would be. I mean, obviously, it, it helps in these certain cases, but if I wonder how that enables diversity across companies that don't have it currently or if they're even aware of it, if that's enough. Well, I think it's a really good starting point because Slack actually has some of the best, I guess, female-leaning terminology. So, like, they talk about lasting relationships and meaningfully and care deeply. And they have one of the more diverse environments. Of course, more diverse is still, like, 20-30% female. But for the field it's in that's really good and they don't actually even have like a head of diversity yeah i know airbnb kind of has a similar feel they have like a lot of really great lead design female leaders who are just they've like they've taken departments in the way they do design at airbnb and turned it on its head and made it incredibly efficient but also like create meaningful experiences and job opportunities for all sorts of people so it's the importance is definitely there uh, and I wonder if it's if it's more of a it's just comes down to how company conscious you are. Like if you're if you're seeing you're having problems in designing products and you're just not really meeting the in me in needs. I think so, I think diversity is something people have never really equated to like being well, that maybe that's part of the problem. We're picking from the same type of people. We're not like incorporating, you know, uh, people from way different backgrounds of different whether that means like educational or it means ethnic anything like that so i mean i I think it has a lot of implications yeah definitely different backgrounds is also where where they talked about you shouldn't just post to the same three job boards like uxpa indeed that's all great but then also post to like some of the college boards that aren't necessarily Harvard, MIT, blah, 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 like some more local colleges, some more historically minority colleges. Well, like, so awesome. yeah, apply to Stanford also. How about Michigan? How about Howard? How about UMass Lowell? Yeah, I mean, because that, that makes so much sense because there's just going to be different different types of people that are getting similar skill sets. I mean, I know there's the connotation of you went to Stanford, you went to Harvard and you got this degree, you should be in the top tier of the best. But I've, 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 this is personal anecdote stuff, but I've met people from both sides that have gone to either like started in community college and graduated from a state school versus went to Harvard or Stanford. And I've seen their qualities of work be very similar and their work ethic be almost equivalent, if not more on one side than the other. Uh, so it's that's that's really interesting. So was there any other kind of big takeaways from the talk about like incorporating diversity in your teams? Uh, let's see. One more thing was uh, to think about timing. If you're trying to hire someone in the next four weeks, you might not have everyone you want apply. Um, like after October 31st, most people that are more situated in their life are focused on the holidays and families. And so like late July, August, September, it's kind of hard to recruit for more difficult, uh, senior roles. So... So this is all really cool. So this, they're not just focused on like diversity within the workplace, but they're also kind of focused on diversity even with your application methods or, or um, recruitment methods, right? So it's not just let's, let's hire uh, men and women of various um, you know, ethnic backgrounds or, or anything like that. It's, it's more how can we design our recruitment methods to achieve that diversity uh, without, you know, actively going out to seek it. Is, is that making sense? So it's like we're, we're diversifying the places that we send this thing out to. We're diversifying when we are sending this stuff out to get people. We're diversifying how we 
uh, talk about these jobs. And in return, you're hoping that you are building a more diverse team, which ultimately will lead back to sort of a more rounded out, thoughtful product that will then feed the users themselves, right? So that's ultimately the chain of events here. Yeah. Yeah, it kind of sounds like just conscious distribution. Like if you're, if you know what you're trying to recruit for, just like putting a little more effort into like, like Nick and Brian have said, the the content that you're putting out there when you're putting it out there, it's just, it just seems a little bit more like you just have to be, it's a concerted effort uh, and not just like, oh, we need somebody. Here's the typical job thing that we put out there. Let's just try as hard as we can that way versus like really thinking about it and being mindful. Yes, it's all just about intentionality. So that's really cool. Um, so we went from interactive journey maps to hope not being a method and, and focusing on diversity. And then and then what? What's next? How do you follow that? Uh, data visualization. Oh, I love it. Let's, let's jump into it. Yeah, so this was an awesome designer from Autodesk, you know, a small startup. <laughs> Yeah, the smallest of small, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but she was just talking about how a lot of times people think that like data viz is something that's more recent and more digital, but it's really been around for a while. Like uh, cartography, they were doing it in the 11th century, carving tracks onto stone. So yeah, then, I mean that's that's it's got like such a deep history, right? I mean, did, so when she was talking about data visualization, because I'm really excited to hear about this because I've seen so many data scientists like talk about data visualization, but in my opinion and what I've seen for the lay person, some of the visualizations they create could use somebody's touch from a design perspective. Like it's they're they're putting a heavy heavy thought into how the algorithm works to break down and information but in terms of how it's presented it's it's very it's geared towards a very specific audience so i'm, I'm kind of curious to what you think about how she made changes to that kind of paradigm that exists in data viz yeah no uh one of my favorite slides was one about kind of a uh, depressing topic but uh iraq's bloody toll so this was made to it was a bar chart but it was flipped upside down and it was in red. So it looked like the chart was bleeding. So the whole purpose of that was to elicit a very strong emotional response and then have you look at the actual numbers. Wow, yeah, I mean, that's that's taking it to a completely different level. I mean, really trying to pull at your heartstrings based off of what's being shown. So this is this is kind of an interesting topic, I think. So Nick, from your perspective, how do you feel about something like that? Because when, when we think of data visualization, I mean, there's a lot, a lot of things that come to mind. But what do you think from like the human factors perspective of what that really means of showing something that's like in the from the visual sense, it's very emotionally stunning, uh, but it's conveying data. I okay, so this is this is gonna be uh, this might be a little controversial here, but something like uh, Iraq's bloody toll, the 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 graph that you just described, where it looks like it's bleeding. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I think that appeals to a very different type of argument, and I I think I, I don't know if it's most the most effective way to display information, but that's not to say I don't think it's not the most effective way to make a point right this almost seems more like a political argument about philosophy around um sending troops to iraq rather than here's the cold hard facts of how many people have died and and i, I i'm going back and forth on it but ultimately i think you know it, it, back to sort of the tufty way of thinking right less less ink on the page um simple standard think about all these sort of um, things and you get none of them with this bar chart, but it still conveys the information that the artist was intending. I, I don't know. I feel like this is borderline art rather than um, data visualization. And I, I don't know. It's a, it's a conversation we can have, 
But that's kind of where I'm I'm at. See, I get where you're going, but I actually don't think it is unclear at all. It is definitely biased or political. It's definitely there to make a statement. But if you read the chart, you can still read all of the bars just as well as if it was flipped over the other way and gray. I, it's still just as useful. Sure, but uh, I'm curious, Blake. What are you, what are your thoughts on this one? Because you kind of uh, you kind of led yeah, me the, into thinking about it first. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I mean, so this is kind of, this is really strange for me, right? Because this is a totally different turn than I would have expected the conversation to go. Which I like it, um, but I'm kind of with Nick. I mean, in some ways, I feel like this is it, not so much that it's art, but it is certainly. And Brian, you you said this too, but it's certainly getting at trying to illustrate a specific point of view. And now when we're talking about this topic, there's there's really no two ways about it. Like it, the Iraq war was obviously a very bloody war, as this depiction shows, whether it was just a bar chart by itself or this kind of more visual visualized perspective. Um, but it it's kind of strange because I, I was when I started this talk, right, I was really leaning towards wanting to see something more, you know, designed towards the lay person to be able to view versus what you see from a lot of the data science community that's very very, they present data in a way that's not always the simplest for people to understand or make sense of, where this kind of like goes on the opposite end of the spectrum, where it's, it's almost as if it's, as if it's conveying a message. So long way to say, like, I feel like I'm conflicted in some ways, right? Because it, the, on the inside from education side, I'm a scientist. So I respect and want to understand what's going on from a data point of view. And I, I want to like be able to der derive any kind of facts that I pull out from data as much as possible. But at the same time, I I could see where this is coming from. And you're, they've designed a, for lack of a better way of putting it, they've designed a user experience around this particular set of data. And that's to convey this specific message that this thing was super bloody and it was a war, so things were not so great and all that kind of stuff, but it also is conveying data. So it's I, I kind of fall in between almost the two sides of me, right? So being like the scientist, human factors practitioner versus the like UX design front end developer. Uh, so I, I really don't have strong opinions either way. I think it's a it's an interesting dichotomy, though. Let me let me jump in here with one more thing too. So if you if you search this Iraq's bloody toll, um, you you can find Google Image search it. You can find it out there. There are there's a flip side, right? So so there's the Iraq's bloody toll. It's colored red to indicate blood. It's also, like you said, it's flipped upside down. It looks like blood is dripping from the page. It gives you that very sort of visceral, like, oh, yeah, this is a lot of blood on uh, on Iraq's soil, right? Now, it, there's there's another image of this whole thing flipped. It's blue, and the the story is flipped. It says... Iraq deaths on decline or deaths on the decline. And it kind of shows like, yeah, over time, uh, less and less people are dying. Still, it's conveying a message that um, you know, it, it's kind of like flipping the argument, right? Like one is, oh, this is a very bloody toll that's being um, a lot of people are dying. And the other one is like, look, people are dying less and less, but people are still dying. And I looking at these two graphs, man, I got to be honest, I... <sighs> I resonate more with the one on the right just because you see graphs more frequently and I can still understand that there's a lot of death here. Um, but, you know, on the right, it's 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 adding that flair to it. It's almost it, like I said, it's it's almost like art. It's data art. And I'm wondering if that's sort of what this whole conversation that this um, this UX visual data visualization uh, designer from Autodesk was talking about. Is that kind of um were they kind of talking about the art in data visualization to convey certain messages kind of um cuz i guess everything has an inherent perspective so it's very important to communicate what you're trying to communicate whatever that is yeah, and in, th in this case, it's kind of interesting because Nick, I just I found what you're talking about with the two graphs kind of side by side, and it's it's insane to think that it's it's almost it's the same exact data but flipped upside down, colored differently, and giving you a different message. So I think that rings really true with br what Brian just said. I mean, it's all about what message you want to communicate. But I think we, I think we kind of are getting 
well, not we, as in the perver- maybe the proverbial we, but as like a design group, we have to be cu- careful how we're conveying this information because this is depending on which way you look at it. I mean, it's kind of it's very biased. Uh, so there's no really kind of medium ground here of just presenting the information like almost, I don't know, giving it in just gray and just saying deaths in Iraq, like no, no kind of spin left or right. Um, so it's it's I don't know. This is this has really gotten me a lot more confused about data visualization than I was when we started this conversation. Yeah. So I'm, I'm definitely curious as to what sort of this Autodesk designers main uh, main presentation was about. Um. Let's see. So it really was a lot less uh, political than perhaps I've inadvertently made it. <laughs> but I do think it's always important to remember that like both of those are views and you have to make sure that whatever you design is going to have a view. What do you want it to be? But um, she also showed some really cool uh, animated graphs about temporal data. Oh, that's interesting. So, yeah, I wish I had a good uh, GIF for you, but there was one for the population of China versus the population of India. And I think it was really effective to communicate with the animation because you could see for China, the population has swelled in the past but then it's kind of on the down. And then for India, it just is pretty steady. It kind of hit a peak, and now it's just staying there year after year. So that's interesting because there's often a lot of... Um, there, there's difficulty in sort of representing two axes in three dimensions w- when you incorporate time, right? So like, let's say you have variable mm-hmm. X, variable Y, and time, which is variable Z. And so how do you plot that on a graph? Well, you can show this 3D thing, right? Where you have sort of a line graph of, you know, one one attribute is time. And let's say, let's say one is temperature and one is, um, I don't know, uh, the human factors cast listeners, right? So you look at the temperature and you look at human factors cast, and it's hard to understand the relationship between both of those over time. But if you were to show sort of um, the graphs in a GIF form, I guess this is a really bad example, but your your example of uh, population is is a good one, right? So so you can actually visually see. I'm curious, do they show like regions in which the um, right? So it's like geospatial data overlaid with population and time. Is that were those the three variables? Well, so for this one in particular, it was essentially a bar chart of the population. For that entire population, that entire year, from like 0 to 100. And then it put a line where the median age was. Okay, I think, I think I'm looking at it right now. I'm going to post this uh, in our show notes here. Um, I think I'm looking at this right now. So it's, it's almost like a waterfall graph where the, the lines are going up and you can kind of see um, sort of the expansion and contraction of the population right with the total at the bottom is that kind of what you're yeah exactly okay but because it was animated you could see it per year so you could still see the entire population in one glance and how it is going to be changing in the future okay yeah i i see it now so i i just sent it to you guys so you guys can see it too and i'm going to post this in our um in our show notes as well so um, but yes, I, I, I can see the effectiveness of this. I, now I'm wondering, you, you could definitely communicate something like this in, um, in geospatial terms as well, but, uh, this is, this is interesting as well. Uh, so I'm, I'm wondering, were there any other sort of ways in which this Autodesk designer suggested ways for, uh, data visualization? Uh, the hierarchical data one thing that was interesting was the tree diagram versus the tree map. For me in particular, that was new. I hadn't seen a tree map before, though clearly I've seen tree diagrams. So yeah. What, so when you say tree map, would you can you just like describe a little bit what that means? Yeah. So the tree map 
would pretty much take the tree diagram hierarchy of like a family tree, this thing, then gave those two things, um, but then compressed it into a square. So you still have position from top to bottom, but it's then stacked with, uh, I guess, the ratio and the size of the rectangle is proportionate to the data. So, okay. So is it is it basically like a bunch of like let's say we just have one square and it's a bunch of blocks that are filling up that square that are basically proportional based on how much they impact the overall kind of information that's being presented. Because I think I'm looking at one right now. It looks like oh. It's not quite Tetris blocks, but that's kind of how it's colored. But they take up different space based on, I uh, guess, information that's underlying them. Exactly. Okay. And cool. uh, based on colors and the position, you can see which one's related to which. Ah, uh, okay. So okay. it's just a much more compact way. I see. So, so uh, Blake, are you looking at this one with uh, brass percussion woodwinds? Is that the one you're looking uh at? Uh, I'm actually looking at a breakdown of Dr. Pepper, Coca-Cola, and other soft drinks. Oh, okay. Well, I'm looking at one. <laughs> okay, so basically, you have these subgroups, and if they're touching another subgroup, uh, those two are related on the map. And then if you have, and the size of which kind of dictates the. Um, help me out here. What what does the size dictate there? Does it dictate anything? Am I looking at something completely different? For this one, the size dictates the like number of units it okay. is. Got but. it. Okay. Okay. So that that's an interesting way of thinking about things. I because that conveys that conveys three things: relationship data, um, labels of subgroups, and also quantity of subgroup participants or or whatever the units are. Um, so that's that's interesting. So did, they, did she give you any kind of indication of really why it was beneficial to be using the, the tree kind of map versus a tree diagram or what they were like trying to communicate why one was more useful than the other? Well, the tree diagram is better at a glance a lot of times, but it takes up a lot of space. So the tree map is a much more compact thing, and especially with everyone's mobile focus, you can't necessarily have a really big tree diagram or you can't read anything. So really the tree map was just a next best thing that's way better at being compact. Uh, okay, so now, now I'm kind of seeing a little more of the utility of it because that makes a lot more sense being able to try and still convey that relationship kind of information that you get from the tree or get like seeing what ancestors are related to what. But in this case, it's like a, a, a cleaner and a definitely much more like responsive wise available for mobile visualization of that same information. So, okay, that's cool. Okay, so uh, were were there any other pieces of data information or data visualization that this person talked about, or or uh, was that it? Uh, it talks about chord diagrams, and then mainly just uh, how they used all their visualization to do what they do, which is her in particular, lots of civil engineering. So she used visualization to show like water and how. Um, a flood would happen and so what buildings in what areas need to get raised and how much okay so that's that's combining that geospatial uh data with with like flood data um and and quantity of rainfall uh, potentially so okay so that's that's cool man that's that's a lot of information that 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 person packed into that and and it spawned some really great conversation here at least um so i'm wondering what what did you go to next next i just went to this really amusing event um they called it the ultimate smackdown oh qualitative that sounds... versus quantitative oh yes <laughs> okay this this will be this will be a fun conversation because um there's often a lot of debate, qualitative versus quantitative. And as as we have kind of talked about on the show multiple times, 
it's both, right? And so I'm wondering, was the punchline, it's both in this thing? It's almost like you've been to these things before. <laughs> It's like, yeah, it's the typical answer, right? Especially when you're in a room full of psychologists, I guess. Oh yeah, it's totally what I was expecting going in. Like it's both, but this was like towards the end of the day, and they just put on a really entertaining show. Like they had Mr. T test, Mr. T test. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> yes. I'm gonna be making yeah. that meme later tonight. I can tell you that now. Oh my gosh! <laughs> All right. So, so I guess what were the sort of main arguments for and against? They did this in a in a in a very entertaining way. And um, what were the major arguments for and against, both qualitative and quantitative? And then what was the major takeaway? Obviously, that you use both, but uh, sort of what spin did they put on it? Yeah. So the major. Um things for qualitative is it's much more exploratory and you can uh, get a lot more information from a smaller sample size and you don't have to take the time to poll 300 people necessarily. But, and then quantitative came back with, yeah, but your sample size is normally five. So if one of those people is really weird, it can throw off your whole thing. And if you're giving a presentation to some CEO, he's probably going to want a very big poll that is actually significant or statistically significant. Right, right. Oh, goodness. Yeah, that gets into a whole like other bag of worms, too. Like if you, especially if your CEO is is very cognizant of statistics and really wants to see a statistically significant difference, like when we're talking about from the numbers itself, I mean that can get you into a whole set of mess that you don't even know what to do with. I mean, because if you're polling 300 people, what if how many people are going to respond? But like then, then if what if you get something inconclusive, and then how do you even report that back to your CEO? So that's that's a that's a difficult conundrum for sure. Right. So what were some of the major uh, pros and cons of quantitative then? So for quantitative, um, you can get a lot of numbers, but if you don't know what numbers you're trying to get, like it doesn't really matter if you like 100 people agree with you, but the thing they're agreeing with you on is really dumb. It doesn't really matter if you're not actually solving the problem. Right, so you kind of have to have that foresight of what you need before you go out and collect the data. Right. Okay, and then so what was the major takeaway from this one? Brace yourselves, folks. This one's going to be profound. So qualitative and quantitative work really well together. They somehow seem to go hand in hand. I know, mind-blowing. <laughs> I, I had that queued up. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Mind-blowing awesome. information here, folks. We are breaking down the most up-to-date, wonderful uh, findings from UXPA Boston. Okay, so so that was the ultimate SmackDown, qualitative versus quantitative. Uh, was that the end of the day? I know you said that was towards the end of the uh, end of the day there. Um, yeah, that was the end of day besides just going around and talking to a bunch of awesome people. So you went out and networked that night, right? I, I know you, you uh, when we asked you, you said you were out networking in quotes, and I was just making sure that uh, you were indeed networking. <laughs> yeah, my uh, LinkedIn expanded too, so I guess it was useful. That's Excellent. Awesome, man. <laughs> that is wonderful. So so uh, I guess the last thing we want to kind of ask you and check in with you is sort of um, – you know, if, if there are any sort of younger listeners who are in school, uh, who, who may be on the fence about attending one of these events, um, what kind of benefits do you think that they will get from attending something like this? And uh, what kind of sort of recommendations do you have from your personal experience? Like, what would you have done differently? What did you do that was a, a good thing? And then, um, you know, where would you have preferred to kind of... Uh, explore a little more if you had the chance to oh man i could have gone to it really i wanted to like split my body and go to all the tracks at the same time yeah that's like always the common problem right which is why you like bring a bunch of buddies and try and split each other up yeah 
it's one of those good problems. Too much good stuff. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I was gonna say the same thing, Blake. You, you bring a bunch of friends who have similar interests, and then you divide and conquer, and then report back, and hopefully something good comes of it. <laughs> you make a podcast about it. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah, especially if you're younger, I would a totally recommend going, and b for a lot of these events, like this one in particular. You can volunteer, help out, meet some awesome people, and then go for free. So if the financial thing is a problem, go and volunteer. That's what I did. And I. it was actually even better than I think if I didn't because uh, we volunteered in groups of two. So you automatically have someone there you know. You meet new people. Yeah, that's a great takeaway. Um I just want to before we before we end this coverage, I, I kind of want to break down. So we've done a couple of these um, sort of uh, bonus episodes on different conferences and and different types of conferences, and and at least in my mind, uh, they they all kind of have different themes, right? So like with HFES, it's very researchy and kind of application focused, but still based in research. And then with something like Kai, it's it's more of a focus on technology. But it really sounds like what UXPA is doing is kind of focusing in on that process and um, figuring out what you can do, or at least the ones that you went to, right? Like what you can do to help um, help facilitate the process of you know making making a better user experience i guess i i'm trying to find the right words here but but it's more focused on the process at least that's what i'm hearing um and and i know you've listened to all of our bonus episodes and i'm curious if if you share the same sort of sentiment do you do you, is that something you think is uh accurate yeah it was focused on the process of making sure everything is usable by a human at the end of the day yeah, it was very process-based. All right, Blake, do you have any other closing thoughts on this guy here? No, I just, I'm really thankful that you're able to share this with us because I'm a part of UXPA in LA and I love hearing about like the different organizations. I know Boston's like a big influence in the entire community. So it was great to hear about the experience you had and kind of the different tracks. So that's, thanks for sharing your experience with us. Yeah, Brian, thanks so much for uh, coming on the show. Like I said, he is our, he was one of our top listeners, I guess. He's always active in the Slack. But that's going to be it for our coverage of UXPA for today, everyone. What did you guys think? Did you see something interesting at UXPA uh, that, you know, we missed? Let us know. You can follow us on social media. Head on over to the Human Factors Cast, LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter at H Factors Podcast. Be sure to join the discussion on our SoundCloud. Or like I said, we have a Slack. Come join us in there. Or if you're uh, feeling a little old school, I guess uh, you can leave us a voicemail at 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. Or, you know, you can just be boring and send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. That's okay, too. If you like what we're doing, you can support us on Patreon like Brian does at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. Be sure to like, subscribe, review us on Apple Podcasts, the Google Play Store, or whatever your favorite podcast directory is. And, of course, you can reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. I want to thank my friends here for being on the show today. Brian McDonald, where can our listeners find you? Uh, I'm on Twitter at Brian C. McDonald. Excellent. And Mr. Blake Garnstorff, where can our listeners go and find you? You guys can find me on Twitter at Don't Panic UX. Excellent. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again, guys, for tuning in to our Human Factors Cast bonus episodes. Until next time, it depends. It depends. Ha, ha, ha.